Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, so first up, uh, my name is Braga. As Vincent already introduced, I work for Luxola. So we're an e-commerce company. We sell cosmetics and beauty products. And I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, the things we learned, observed from IT audit. So it's something we earlier in the year went through. So the whole objective of this talk is to kind of share what we went through. Maybe we learned a few things. Uh, some things we observed, some things were like uh, just more learning for us, so we want to share it with the community. Uh, so nothing super technical, it's kind of a bit abstract, so uh, if you're looking for something a bit hardcore, yeah, forgive me, sorry, but uh, uh, that's kind of the theme. Uh. Well, okay, let me just get rid of the menu bar. Still sticking around. View. View. Yeah. Ah, crap. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so first up, what's basically an IT audit, or uh, what is any audit for that matter, right? So uh, it's just an independent entity outside of the two parties involved who come in, who evaluate independently that whatever is presented is good, is in a good state, et cetera, right? And in case of IT audit, specifically auditors who come on board, who basically check that whatever you presented as your IT infrastructure, as your IT assets, uh, good, scalable, whatever's the desired business metrics that they want to look at and as stated. Um, and it's also usually a part of a due diligence process. So basically when one company acquires another, they just want to go through this process to see whatever stated, be it revenue, be it IT, is uh, pretty good. Uh, so that's the official interpretation, but the unofficial one usually is lots of lots of questions, things that you actually make a decision on and you wouldn't even think that you'd have to justify it. So you'd probably have to go to someone and have to justify it like, a, one example, right, is right. You choose to host on Heroku, and you probably have your developer-based justifications. And then you have to go and say, hey, OK, why did you not choose, I don't know, say, AWS? How did, why did you not choose X, Y, or Z? What is your motivation? And it, it goes on and on and on. So that's one more way to kind of look at this one. Um, and why am I speaking about this? Again, something Vincent broke a little bit. So my company, Luxola, got acquired by Sephora. So Sephora is a cosmetics retailer owned by the LVMH group. So they acquired us earlier this year. Uh, so we had to go through this elaborate due diligence process. And that's kind of where the entire experience comes from. So first up, right, so the first thing that got looked at from us is the IT architecture, right? So what basically is an IT architecture? I mean, it could be a few different things. It could have a few different interpretations. Like it could be your application topography. Right? Whenever a company is small, you're working on one primary product, that's your application, but as and when you grow, you evolve into having you know, either multiple services, multiple products, uh, but what are these? Um, and also, once you have multiple products and multiple services, uh, how do they interact with one another? What kind of data flows do you have? What kind of interfaces do you have? Um, um, what is basically the relationship map between the different services you got? Um, also, when you go applications, every one of them have a hardware stack, a software stack. What is your stack like, right? In Rails, you know, you have this famous DHH Omokase stack and then the custom stack, so I think you definitely know what this one is. Uh, also, what is your build and release process? So, how many times do you guys deploy in a day? How do you package your code? How do you build it? How do you release it? Uh, where do you release it as well? And finally, the hosting and the deployment topology. So how do you actually deploy? Like, do you use Chef? Do you, you know, use something like uh, Git and Heroku to deploy? Uh, again, that's one more thing that, that was being asked. That was something that was curious. So in case of Luxola, right, so our application topology kind of very roughly looks like this. So we have the e-commerce engine. So that's the first one we started building like four years back. And that's our primary product of sorts. So it handles a whole bunch of stuff like, you know, the uh, registration, login, checkout, payments, navigation, search, et cetera, et cetera. So any, any, anything you would probably typically look at from uh, e-commerce uh, engine of sorts. 
Uh, but also, I think, besides what the user sees, you also have the backend systems and the CMSs that come into play. So anything and everything can be customized from the backend, because we have a staff of about 100 people. So these people interact with the systems on a daily basis to manage the systems. Uh, so whatever tools that's needed for those people to do, they work efficiently. Uh, once we got that ticked, so the last two are uh, completely different products. So we have our own warehouse management system and our inventory management system. So these are products we build because we do our own fulfillment. So if you place an order on Luxola, it goes through the e-commerce engine, it flows down to the order management system, and finally into the warehouse management system. Uh, so this is, again, one more application that we built uh, ourselves. Uh, so that became a part for topology of sorts. And finally, payments. Right. I mean, if you, if you are in this region of the world, payments is like a very interesting space. I think there's a whole bunch of alternative payment types besides the credit cards. So you go Malaysia, you got one trend. You go Indonesia, you got completely different trend. And if you're focusing on the ASEAN region, then uh, it's it's a pretty complex tool in itself. And then you got your APIs, right? So uh, there's a whole bunch of APIs your application is going to be dealing with. Be it your exchange rates, be it your uh, if your warehouse management system deals with the logistics APIs, uh, there's your MailChimp, Mandrill, your SendGrid, whatever is your communication-based APIs. So all the APIs kind of get bunched together in one place. And finally, your analytics. So if you're doing any kind of BI reporting, uh, your data warehouse, your Google Analytics, so these get bunched into one bucket as well. Um, so the, the, the one important thing kind of was a key takeaway for us for from us for this was like uh, these things, right? Any, I think I'm, I'm not going to detail of every one of those I presented in the last one for sake of time. But this is something you, all of you guys know by your head. You, all of you are developers. You work on it one way or the other, and you have it in your head. But we never bother to document it, put in a place. So if you do it, it's usually out of date, right? So you basically draw just rough diagrams like this. You draw some squares, and you leave it elsewhere. But you know, make an effort to put all the collective intelligence. Basically, probably the senior members in your team are probably going to know this. They're going to be working on their respective components. But put it in a piece of document, share it in whatever's your favorite tool, be it your GitHub wiki, your private wiki, or oh no, whatever's, whatever's your poison, right? Uh, try, to, try to document it. Try to put it on a piece of paper uh, or a piece of document. Uh, the other thing we kind of found that was pretty good out of this was that once we started doing this, uh, Onboarding new developers was really easy, because once we bought them on board, we had a document we could give them to them and say, hey, OK, look, this is kind of how systems work. This is what we have. So I think you have your tests and that give you a level of documentation, et cetera, but that's way more fine grain. You want the bigger picture. And as in many systems become complex, it's important to bring these layers outside of your tests. And I think uh, that's one thing we kind of took away from this first part of the exercise. Um, uh, next up, uh, development practices. So you buy a piece of software. You want to know that it's actually well-made. It's not going to break one month from now. It's not going to break when your traffic quadruples, et cetera. So a lot of focus goes into how this was actually made. So how do we actually develop? So I think this was one of the easier things for us to explain. Because when you go to develop, make sure that you, you cover a couple of the basics, right? So whether you do Agile, whether you do Waterfall, make sure like everyone in the team understands what it means and uh, what the implications of one or the other. Uh, but also, I think, uh, how do you care for code quality and other metrics really matter? I think uh, one of the things we actually already were practicing before the audit was like, it's Ruby, right? So you don't try test, then people are going to look down on you, right? So you, you do test for your own. You do test for your own goodness sake. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very testing fervent community. So I think we are one of them as well. Uh, so we had testings kind of pretty much nailed down. So we had uh, RSpec going. We have unit tests. We have a couple of integration tests, which I actually really like. Uh, so we have Selenium covering like the key flows in our e-commerce engine, like the sign-in and the registration, the checkout. Because if it breaks in any one of the builds, then our app is technically broken. So uh, we also had some sanity and smoke tests. So basically, we are deployed in Heroku. So uh, all, all the tests are first in the CI, so our CI automatically runs all the tests. And once it's good, it pushes to a Heroku app, that's our staging application. And then we start running some sanity specs. So Selenium starts pointing to here and starts doing it because this is more closer to the production environment uh, than your local browser. Um, also, we had, a, in, in particular to code quality, we had a couple of things that was going for us. Maybe these are things you guys can look up as well. So first, we had code climate. So code climate covers quite a few stuff. So if you guys don't know what it is, it's basically a hosted 
code review solution for uh, Ruby and Rails applications, but I think they've moved on to other languages as well, but started out from Ruby and Rails. So it gives you a whole bunch of metrics around how complex is your code, it grades your code. Uh, anytime there's a security issue or anytime there is a bad styling issue, it points it out, so you can actually have a unified voice across your entire code base. So that's one thing we had in place. We also had a tool to measure our coverage, so that's one more thing we keep in mind because it goes back to testing. How much coverage do we have on board here? And uh, Also, I think we use Hound, so again, one more styling uh, tool from there. Um, yeah, so lastly, documentation. I think that flows back to the previous point. Uh, yeah, your tests are a level of documentation. I think if you write your tests and you put in your describe blocks that give you a um, finer detail, but also I think have another layer of documentation that's between the previous one, which is the, your architectural level documentation and your tests. So maybe you write a new module, you write a new, I don't know, say product, just again, put in a more developer words what it means purely for the purpose of yourself in the future because you tend to forget things and also for other developers. And we found that pretty incredibly valuable. We had it missing for some pieces, and that's our learning because for those that were missing was the hardest pieces to get new developers on board, or the hardest ones to refactor as well because uh, it was all floating in the head rather than having it in one place. All right, so the next one's a slightly bit of a controversial topic. So one of the things they, they look for is technology ownership. So if you claim your technology is one of your key strengths, it's like ultimately who owns the technology becomes this question, right? And then especially if people are not aware, open to this community, they have this averseness to open source. Um, so I think we had to kind of win that over a little bit because um, the moment people say open source and they say GPL, lawyers in particular freak out like crazy. Um, so the, the, the most important thing here is, I think, we, I think if you're any good with your words, you can probably convince half the people that, okay, it's not uh, as bad as you imagined, right? But what actually really wins over people is that, okay, yes, we use open source, but we know what we're doing, and we know what are the license that goes into our project, and we have some process in place to monitor it. Because that was the key thing for us, and that's going to be the key thing for you guys as well. Because anytime you add a gem, anytime you use anything from there, you are adding a new dependency. You are likely or not bringing in new license. So I'm not saying don't do that, but just try to get an understanding of what you're actually doing or what kind of license you're bringing in. So understand what's the difference between your Apache versus MIT versus LGPL versus your GPL license. There's a whole bunch of others actually, uh, but try to try to understand what the implications are without going into the complete details of it. So one of the nice things we did was uh, this really nice software called uh, License Finder that's from Pivotal Labs. Uh, so basically this is a tool that pulls up all these dependencies from your gem spec and gives you this gigantic list. But that's pretty useless, right? If you have, in our case, I probably have what 300 over gems. Mm, the list is pretty useless. But the useful part is you can actually whitelist and blacklist saying, OK, I'm never going to, for example, take a GPL in my project. Or I'm always going to approve only MIT and Apache 2 and nothing else. right? So you can potentially do it. And what's even better is that it's tied to our CI, so no one monitors it. Our CI does it for us. So anytime one of our developers adds a new code and puts it in some place, and if it breaks a dependency, a build is going to fail, and it's going to flag everyone. Uh, so this is, I think, one of, one of the really nice things that came out for us, maybe something for you to explore. I had a quick question. So does this do like, transitive dependencies? Because with GPL, you have to take care of transitives as well. Yeah. I think, I think for us, we didn't use GPL, or wherever dependencies we had GPL, we either rewrote or used some other dependencies. Uh, actually, I think even for LGPL, it was kind of like a gray area for us, actually. So we don't, but uh, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of what it boils down to, essentially. All right, uh, so the next one is uh, security. Uh, so obviously, the application you buy needs to be secure. So just make sure you do the same things right. So just understand what, how you store your sessions and what our implications are. Right? Do you store your session in your cookie? Do you store it in your database? Do you store it in, I don't know, Redis or Memcache, which is probably not a wise idea, but do you store it in your elsewhere, right? And if you put it in one place, what are the implications? If you put it in a cookie, can you put in sensitive data in there? Likely not, but depends on if it's encrypted or in case of Rails, it's usually just you know tampering protection rather than um, complete protection. So understand how session management works and what you are putting, what you're doing when you actually do uh, cookie-based session management, but also passwords. Oh, I have a bit of a rant, but maybe I'll just stay a bit polite on this one. Um, so please, please always, you know, salt, hash your passwords. Don't store them in plain text. 
because I had this really bitter experience from a local company. They're a huge local real estate company. I shall not name the name, but I, I created an account with them, and then I got this really nice, hey, welcome, and then here's your password. I was like, wow, okay. Now we are first completely screwed up my password, which I probably might or might not have used elsewhere. But also, on the funny side, at least, they don't need to ever send a forgot password email. That's all you need to do is just you know search for your welcome email, and you have your password in plain text. So please don't do any of those. Uh, denial of service vulnerabilities. With Ruby, your symbols never garbage collected. There's also a bunch of other gotchas. Don't create any records without sufficient protection in place. Like If you have a registration in place, bots can potentially attack it. And uh, if it's an expensive process, you're probably running into a DOS. And if there's any process that creates uh, your symbols and never, at, at least with the current Ruby, I think with the newer ones, it's going to be garbage collected, but at least for now. Um, if there are edge cases which leads to this, keep an eye out for them. Um, now with, when it comes to hosting, yeah, with AWS in particular, use IAMs. So basically, it's very simply put, if you guys are not aware, it's like a per user based security rather than a master security, right? And if you have root keys and if you have master ones, get rid of them pretty much ASAP because if they get compromised, your entire account is screwed. So make sure you create new IAM users for your production servers, your staging servers, your developers, put them in groups. Uh, try to make sure you have that covered. Um, and lastly, I think a couple of the things I touched on, Breakman and Code Climate. So basically, these are hosted tools. But also DevBot, which is by our own and only Winston. <laughs> so the thing with open source and having multiple dependencies is uh, that you have lots of gems and lots of dependencies, right? And there are vulnerabilities being reported like, I don't know, every day, every week, probably even more frequent than that. How do you even stay on top of it, right? And if, if I'm probably a hacker and want to hack somebody else, I'm going to look out for these vulnerabilities, and it's very easy to tap on. So, it's important to stay ahead of the game because if you have 300 over dependencies, you can't potentially upgrade them every single day or whatever. So Winston draws a really nice bot that basically goes through your dependencies and automatically sends in a pull request, with, especially in the security base, with the latest versions, so you kind of get covered. So uh, one more thing for you guys to consider. Uh, PCI compliance, so this is one of a big topic for us. I'm not going to jump into too much detail for this, but I think uh, Dinesh Raju from Referral Candy, I think a couple of months back, he did a really nice presentation on this full on. So maybe if you want full details, you can kind of go back. Uh, but first thing, never ever store credit cards in your database. Uh, it's really, really too risky, and you open up to lots of attacks and a lot of compliance requirements if you do it. Don't ever do it. It's not worth it. Um, also, I think uh, what we had to go through was we, we were already compliant. So basically, it's just a very short gist of how we got compliant. right? So the way PCA works is they first determine um, two levels. So first is, how do you handle your card data? right? So do you store it in your database? Do you use a hosted party page? Or do you use transparent redirect or iframing, et cetera? So how do you handle card data determines your one level. And the next level is based on the number of transactions handled. So if you handle millions of transactions, it's a different uh, level of compliance requirement versus several thousands. Uh, so once you know your levels, first thing is the SAQ. It's a self-assessment questionnaire. So basically, a couple of compliance requirements which you have to go in and answer. and uh, um, it's not just a question of answering, because you're going to certify and say, OK, hold to this. So make sure we put in measures to hold on to those as well. Um, and the next one is a pen test, penetration test. Um, so this, again, depends on the level uh, of your PCI. But more likely than not, if you're doing over 50,000 transactions a year, I believe you need this. So you need to get a third party penetration test, security tester, to actually come ping your app and to basically say, hey, OK, it's secure and safe, and certify that. So there are a couple of vendors who are PCA approved. So make sure you find one of those and have them scan your app. And this needs to be quarterly as well. It's not a one-off. So it needs to happen four times a year. Uh, so once you have these two combined, then yeah, finally, you, you get your compliance. Uh, you can present it to your banks, put it on your website, et cetera. Uh, last one is on-site audit. Yeah, this is for the last guys who have huge amount of transactions or, or who are super enough to print these on piece of paper or elsewhere. So I think these guys usually have on-site audit, and people come in and really make life hard for them. Um, last is uh, scalability. So uh, I think this is I think what Winston touched on a bit as well. So uh, Rails can scale. So I think uh, first thing you guys need to do is anytime you have peak periods, so 
just note down the metrics for those. I think uh, for us, we had to go back to two or three years, and the metrics we had to get were like stuff like you know what our response rates were, what is our RPM, uh, how many users did we have on board, and if you use Neuralink or something else, what is your AppDex cost, right? So it can also be a business level metrics: how many orders per minute do you fulfill in, and what is your system capable of? And people don't usually document those, but try to have a uh, uh, I don't know, say maybe have a hand up on these things. Uh, next up, I think. Uh, it's very important to have you know, a controlled environment to be able to test traffic. right? Uh, without that, you're most likely guessing than not. Because if you're handling, I don't know, say 1,000 concurrent users, and the question is, can you handle 3,000? It's going to be a wild guess saying, oh, yes, we can. Because your bottlenecks can be really, really wild. So it can be your database connections. It can be one of your dependencies. Your Redis might blow out. It can be a memcache. Uh, it might be some missing index that is only frequently hit when the traffic goes really, really high. Uh, so it's very important to identify what your bottlenecks are. So try to do your load tests and try to do them on a regular basis. Everyone, I think uh, for our case, we're probably doing it um, way more frequently than we were before. So make sure you give sufficient care to this as well. Uh, this was something we were kind of completely ignoring. Uh, uh, but uh, there are also a couple of other tools you can use, like uh, Apache, Bench, and JMeter. I think JMeter is from. Uh, uh, Java world, but these are pretty standard. So, uh, one more thing you guys can look for. Yeah, so I think uh, that's it from me. Thank you so much. And yes, we're hiring as well. So, if you want to work in a company which uses Rails, which gives you, which does a lot of these cool stuff, but also gives the stability of uh, enterprise, yeah, come speak to me. <laughs> Thanks. I think we don't really take a super fine look at it, but I think we use DevBot to it. I think we're using it not in all our products, but a couple of them at least for the moment. Just so I think it's purely for security perspective than who is the contributor and what the contributions go in. Um, but for the moment, no, we don't. I think we're more focused on the security side of things and see where if, if we are covered. Just now you mentioned about the penetration test. You have to do it like four times yeah. a year in order to get it certified. Yeah. Does that mean that? Uh, like you already know, you need to prepare for this. That's why you have to do it like four times before you know, the acquisition. Or? Oh no, I think uh, we were already certified before. Oh. It's, it's a really unique case. Ideally, we don't have to do it, okay. but we're working with a Thailand bank who are making, in in my opinion, unreasonable demands okay. for it. But then again, it turned out to be good when we actually got uh, acquired because we were already doing it. Okay. Uh, so I okay. think it covered us a bit. Yeah, uh, back to the PCI pen test. Are you using like a vendor like Komodo or something? Yeah, I think uh, we use a vendor called we use a vendor called Security Metrics. Okay. Uh, so it's again, it has to be a third-party vendor right. who is approved. But yeah, we we do use a vendor. Uh, on your production. Yes. Yeah. So how long did the whole I mean, IT audit? Oh, it was actually close to a month. I think there's a whole bunch of things actually skipped through. There are stuff that goes along like. Uh, uh, they look at your org structure, what's the scalability like, they look at you know, what's your budgets, uh, what is the strategic plan you have for IT investments, et cetera, et cetera. So things that I, I kind of have to skip at this point in time, so I try to keep it more focused on a bit more on technology than this. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, so for the, for the stuff that you can't read audit, was it like, just, was there a lot of, oh shit, this should have been done, or was there a lot of, oh, we didn't know about this, and I think it's a, actually a fine mix of both, to be fair. I think, uh, I think especially on, like I touched, the, the bigger challenge for me was to actually speak with a bunch of auditors who, who are very used to working with enterprise systems and who are used to very waterfall model and deploy, I don't know, say a couple of times a year. And then I have to go tell them, say, okay, we deploy multiple times a day. And they're like, what? Right? So that's the first reaction. So, and then next question becomes, if you deploy, then what happens to your, I don't know, your stability, right? So, how do you even test? How oh, test you to automate it? And then the question becomes, okay, how is it automated and what do you actually do for automation? But the bigger challenge was more along the lines of explaining and taking, or taking our point and our uh, viewpoint to them. Uh, but also, there are a couple of points they raised which were valid concerns which I think we were running at a breakneck pace and things we had obviously ignored. And we willfully ignored some of them. Some of them were definitely oh shit moments. So, yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you have 
mentioned the the third party library should be the license. Do you also check the how safe the dependency is? I think the the safety of it usually goes along the lines of when we actually insert, right? So I think when we add a new dependency, that's kind of we see what the library offers and we actually validate if it's something we can potentially do it ourselves. Is it worth injecting in another unknown dependency? Because I think we've grown to a point where I think we have, like I said, 300 over gems. And that's like quite a lot of dependencies already. And I think we're breaking down our main app into a couple of smaller modules already. But uh, if any such check happens, that usually happens when we actually add a new one rather than on an ongoing basis. Right? When we do it on an ongoing basis, the focus is more just that the one we use is secure rather than or has the latest version rather than. Yeah, I think there's a few. I think the code climate is one such. It does more static code analysis, gives you some stuff. Breakman is pretty good. Uh, if you haven't used it, just try it out. I think that's one more thing. It's like really, really good.